I remember when Weta dropped the first shot of Caesar and everybody's like, that's not a real chimpanzee. All of the pillars here, all of the walls, they're all built with a very, very specific algorithm and math. Man, so many suits. So many suits, so many thrusters. <laughs> Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> that first seat. Oh yeah, this is my shot. Oh yeah? Wait, no, no way. <laughs> this is like an iconic <laughs> shot. This is a big, big shot. <laughs>back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We have a treat today. We are joined by Sean Walker from Weta Effects. That's right, he flew all the way across the ocean <laughs> just to be on our show. Sean, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What kind of, what have you worked on? What do you do? I'm uh, Weta's Visual Effects Supervisor. I've done a few films. In fact, I've done every Marvel film that Weta itself has worked on, at least that has been released, aside from Returnals. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been pretty keen to be involved in everything Marvel uh, when, whenever something came along. Yeah. Sweet. Well. Let's jump into some clips and you can break down some of the cool stuff that you've, you've had to do. Oh, he's a smart one, isn't he? So we haven't actually taken a look at any of the Planet of the Apes films yet. I've been holding off because I've been really wanting to do some like deep dive research into it and then do an entire themed episode around the trilogy. But having you here <laughs> seems like a much better opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> I remember when Weta dropped the first shot of Caesar and everybody's like, that's not a real chimpanzee. It was a pretty landmark moment for visual effects and, you know, perhaps a signifier of like where they were going to be moving to like in this decade, you know, kind of like that last little bit of like, we're still on the verge of like the CG, the lighting's not quite a full accurate representation of how physics actually work with light, but it's really close to something like, and we're there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the chimpanzees from Planet of the Apes is a masterclass in leveled simulations, I guess, because you can't just like animate a character's bones and then render it, you know? Yeah. You got all the layers of muscle and skin and then hair. All of those things have to happen in order to have a realistic looking animal. Exactly, you can't have stiff skin and then just have the, the fur simulate as a, a separate element. Everything is layered, it all needs the simulation underneath to make the simulation on top work. So this was my main sequence on this show as well. This was uh, pretty <laughs> crazy. Lots of reflections, lots of CG monkeys. So. Oh my oh, god, yeah, I didn't even think right. about the reflections of the <laughs> car. I've reflections on all the cars. Car reflections before. Yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a lighting lead on this project or what was your role on this project specifically? Yeah, I think I was a lighting lead on this one. So all of these digital creatures running around on an environment, every car had to be modeled and we had to render all the reflections and all of that geometry. Very tricky, but uh, necessary. I mean, you'd notice if you had someone else running around in the reflections. It's one of those <laughs> things, it's like, it's so annoying you can't because see Andy Circus you on have to do it. If you don't add it, people will notice. Yeah. But if you do add it, people don't notice and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right, yeah. This bridge was extraordinarily heavy as well. I think uh, every bolt <laughs> was just modeled and it was so overly detailed and we barely see them. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, because the bridge is obviously a CG bridge because you're not on no. the Golden Gate Bridge. No. I imagine the cars and the ground are real. So a good chunk of them are, but then beyond a certain point, they're all CG, yeah. What were some of the considerations you had to have for a sequence like this? With all of the chimpanzees and parts of a real set and a lot of the set being digital, what would you say was the largest consideration that you had to take? For the most part, it was just dealing with all the interaction. There's just so much that goes on in a sequence like this. For every character or actor that these creatures interacted with, you always had to match move and make sure that you had those beautiful shadows that played off them as well. Same with bounce light, you always want to make sure that if a character is obscuring someone in the plates, then you want to make sure that that's obscured uh, properly as well. And then just, yeah, the, the enormous amount of reflective material in the scene was uh, something you just had to deal with. So Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, this is the second movie, and I remember there being a really cool sort of innovation on this movie, which was on-set motion capture, and you didn't have to like redo any of that stuff in a studio. Yes, exactly. For the most part, I think we called it performance capture, and we did go back to the studio occasionally to do some motion capture. I mean, but... that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, it helps in so many different ways. One, your actors are working in the environment that they mm -hmm. should be, and they're reacting to their environment, which I think is incredibly important. And we also got perfect lighting data to work with. You know, if you're in a studio, you don't see the light react to the performances in the actual environment and on the set. So I think that's another good reason why we were able to get uh, such, you know, beautiful shots in the end. Oh yeah, this is my shot. Oh yeah? Wait, no, no way. I live and rendered this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like an iconic shot. <laughs> yeah. This is a big, big shot. <laughs> This was tricky as hell. And it was the first movie that we started to use Manuka, which is our path tracer that we built from the ground up. And to get this level of detail with the tools that we had at the time was very tricky. These are huge projects. So the amount of people we had working on them was insane. This was at a time when almost the entire facility would be working on uh, individual projects. So uh, mm. yeah, a lot of people worked on these ones. My impression of Planet of the Apes was this is kind of what as demonstration of everything they've learned with character animation from Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and then as they like branched out with like King Kong to then bring it all together now in something that's not Lord of the Rings you know it's not King Kong this is brand new and let's show the world that we can redefine digital effects I, I felt that too when we were even working on it I knew that this was something special Rise was kind of that stepping stone and then when we hit Dawn I just knew that this is sort of pinnacle effects I mean even having worked on these these shots still blow my mind I think the assets were unbelievable to work with the story and the light and the end result still blows my mind even when I come back to watching them years later. I was very disappointed that it didn't <laughs> win the Oscars. I think all three, I, all I three of them are robbed, I tell you. I know. <laughs> yeah. I remember when War for the Planet of the Apes was going to the Oscars. I distinctly remember being like, it's going to win. And then when it didn't, I was like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah. I, 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 was, I was blown away. Anyway. <laughs>that you worked on as well. And this movie was notable in the Iron Man trilogy for having just a ton of different suits. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so many suits. So many suits, so many <laughs> thrusters. <laughs> so we had, uh, what did we end up with? Maybe 40 odd suits, They're all very unique. Our team had to develop ways of handling them all. So all of the thruster work, all of the lasers that they were shooting was pretty much automated at a certain point. Animation would drive the look of all the shots. And then we set up systems that would just replicate what they did, but make it look better. They shot a lot of this on set. So this environment actually existed, but we did go fully digital quite a few times. That was an actual practical effect as well of oh, him cool. like smashing through. Wait, really? Yeah, yeah. So there There's was some lots real of, explosions there and stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of real explosions here. Those containers getting flipped up, all practical. We just put a Igor in here. <laughs> <laughs> Igor is the name of this particular one. Okay. <laughs> and they all had their own names. It was pretty funny. They, you know, they were pretty classic. So this guy, you see him jumping off. That guy who jumps off was literally an actual stunts person who jumped off this insanely oh, wow. high thing. And then we had to get rid of him because he jumped onto a, a digital Iron Man. <laughs> and it ended up this beautiful stunt uh, had to go away. And oh. it would have just, I mean, that is a brave person. To, yeah. It was literally like a bungee jump. So he, Wow. <laughs> which was a little bit sad, but that's the kind of thing that just happens every once in a while. Again, beautiful reference. That's what we end up with. <laughs> that's true, reference is super important. Dude, his arm broke. Yeah, that's definitely a digital arm. This is extremist effect is something that we're pretty much call the extremist effect from now on. Like whenever there's glowing interior mm. bodies. It's a very unique look because, yeah. you know, skin is slightly transparent. If you shine a light through it, it kind of glows. And so that's why you end up with a little bit of like that red sort of glow. But it's a whole different monster when you're having light inside of like an object like that emitting light and it's now glowing from within. Yeah, we actually built this up in so many different layers. We have little volume lights and little point lights that are lighting up Killian's interior here. Okay. And then the veins would occlude the light and the same with the skeleton. So I'm assuming that's a full body replacement, right? Yes and no. Some of it was, but we wanted the uh, tattoos to occlude the light. So we wanted the tattoos to be real. We wanted the skin to be real. So we kept almost all of that. And the rest oh, wow. of this is actually just passes on top and multiple different layers that we use to augment the actual plate rather than replace them entirely. So you're saying a lot of that sort of glow where you can kind of See like the muscle on his arm and the veins and whatnot. Are you saying those are 2D passes on top? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then someone had to roto all of the tattoos and make sure that those passes were occluded by the tattoos as gotcha. well. 
so all of this stuff here. Guy Pierce was on new shows. He had half a beard, and <laughs> they thought it might help if they just glued his beard down to his face. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. So that you're saying this was a pickup, but he was already on another project. This is like Superman's mustache. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a scenario here. Very much, yeah. And they're like, all right, we're going to have to paint out this beard. Yeah. So it'll help if we just make the outline of the beard smaller by gluing it to his face. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? That's actually kind of clever. <laughs> Did it help? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. He's an entirely digital character. Really? Yeah, 100%. Wow. At a certain point, it kind of just makes more sense to <laughs> yeah. do it that way. And exactly. especially for, for like that moment there where he's like, entirely falling apart, crumbling on fire, lava yeah. man. The stuff that comes off him, I think this is a beautiful effect. The skin that yeah. Yeah. that cools and fractures and then peels off. I think yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I really dig it. Man, I can't imagine building a digital human of that quality and of that caliber for like five shots. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's insane. Yeah, I thought Guy Pearce's character here looked extremely well done. Yeah, yeah, for the time as well. Yeah, what year did this come out? Was this 2013? Yep. You know, it's weird to think of a movie like Iron Man 3 being almost a <laughs> decade old. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, Christian is <just> like, <sighs> well. <laughs> when I'm looking for stuff to react to, I go to the comments section of each video. So leave a comment to help me out for the next one. Please. I've not yet seen Black Widow, so you're gonna get raw reactions from me right here. Great. I actually haven't seen it either. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> this was our sort of like super large effects task for the show. I love the rendering of the avalanche. Everything is always perfectly backlit and the lights going through it just in the right way. We studied a lot of uh, real life avalanches to make sure that we were, you know, accurate to the light penetration into an avalanche and snow. It's a lot softer than you would anticipate. So this is a little bit more dense than I think would be real, but we needed that weight to be able to justify the explosions and the destruction that goes on as well. So it's probably a little bit more uh, snow chunky heavy than everything else. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. So with an avalanche, do you simulate it as a fluid sim or a rigid body sim with a bunch of particles? Is it a liquid or smoke type deal? It's a bit of everything, uh, to be honest. So the baseline of the simulation was all simmed in Houdini, where that would describe the overall shape and that would be made out of a little bit more of a solid volume. From that, we simulated using Synapse a much, much larger volume. In fact, this whole thing was essentially one take. One cache. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. sure. Wow. Dang, so there's literally a master file of just like this whole avalanche wiping out this facility that you can just like, yeah, I can. Yeah, can we should, we should real quick, we should clarify for the viewers why <laughs> it's cool that this is all one take. So the avalanche, you're explaining is the entire thing off the mountains, through the field, into this area, just one super long. Super detailed. Somebody just hit yeah. go and they walked away for like what, like three months <laughs> yeah, and then exactly. came back? But the reason we did it is because we wanted the flexibility at the end of the day to alter the timing. Because they were cutting things in and out and uh, you know, if you, you take away a shot, all of a sudden the avalanche isn't in the right place at the right time. So all of that stuff in the background, it's all just one giant simulation that we were able to, you know, reverse and forward wherever we needed to match the composition of the shot. I guess it also makes sense that you'd need to do it in one simulation too, because you need all the like the remnants of the avalanche. Yep. So like, let's say it's like, okay, we need a shot that's like, you know, 30 seconds after the avalanche happened. It's like, we need all that lingering snow and smoke. Exactly. And like, sure, you can go in there, you can start doing it by hand and put yeah. it all in there, but well, how do you get it there? Well, you just, you simulate it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <So. laughs> exactly, yep. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that part's neat. That, that's the promise of uh, simulations right there, is yeah. you could do stuff like that. Because back in the day, you'd have to film it as a real element, but you didn't get to have that kind of interaction with it. No. The one thing is that you always need, you know, simulation is hard, but there are just some things you just can't do without a, a really good effect simulation artist. So I'm not quite convinced it's not just like real steam that you guys filmed. <laughs> yeah. Some liquid nitrogen proud on the table. Of that. Yeah, it looks pretty great. I do agree. So there's one thing I've wanted in life. It's a diamond play button. You get it for having 10 million subscribers on YouTube. Well, we are only 4.55 million subscribers away, so help us out. <laughs> Consider subscribing. <laughs> Hope you're ready. It'll be here any minute.
What did you guys have to do with Guardians of the Galaxy? <laughs> we focused primarily on the third act battle, but we did have a few shots here and there beforehand. Some of the Eclecta shots and the mutiny and ejecting all of some of the soldiers out into space. And then we start here for our third act battle part. I call it the expansion. The big thing throughout production of all of volume two was fractals. We had this shared asset with Animal Logic, I believe, built it. And this one was quite tricky. So all of the pillars here, all of the walls, they're all built with a very, very specific algorithm and math to generate a specific look because fractals can be quite random depending on how you generate it. We had to match exactly what Animal Logic did here. So they saved everything out as points in space. It hmm. wasn't even geometry. It was just uh, particles. Wow. Like oh. point clouds? Yeah, exactly. It's a uh, point cloud. So almost the this entire wall and pillars were built just out of point clouds. Wow. Because you just how the fractal generates it? Yeah. So are we literally looking at a point cloud render or did that get sort of like geometryized at some point? For Animal Logic, I wouldn't be surprised if they did it as a point cloud render. For us, we geometryized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a word. <laughs> geometryized. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess volumized, like volume building, yeah. volume meshing. <laughs> yeah, we meshed, mesh it. meshed it. That's <laughs> the word I'm looking for. <laughs> you killed my mother. I tried so hard to find the form. That best. Oh, I forgot about <laughs> Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that completely. So the Hoff, it was a very sort of rough delivery and we had to, uh, there's a lot of projection work done here to, to get the Hoff to work. And yeah, there was a lot of sort of manipulation to try and get that plate to work. So you guys will build a 3D model, reproject the footage onto the 3D model, yeah. and then do that to be able to relight it and try to make the lighting look like yeah. it was different? That was almost entirely done with grades though, as opposed to mm. 3D relighting. So those are the very, very different looking plates that we I, have. Okay, <laughs> I was actually going to compliment the actors for being like, wow, they actually managed to like do the exact same performance <laughs> spot on. Whoever like directed them to do that, great job. And now I'm looking at the plates and I'm like, not it's not close. remotely the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're looking like completely opposite directions. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> and yet, because I guess you're able to project the geometry onto that and reorient it, you were able to get them to match. But wow, I'm now realizing that was a lot more work than I initially envisioned. Yeah, that was tough. That was very, <laughs> that was very tough. This is one of our favorite shots. I think we had a few people that wanted to do this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So this whole planet has like an internal structure to it that you guys yeah. had to create for this movie. Yep. All of that internal structure is based off that original algorithm that we got. And then we artistically started to pull pieces out, skewer it and bend it into place. Oh, how dense these models are. This environment was insane. Like it was so big. I think a good chunk of these shots probably could have been done in a much cheaper way. But <laughs> In saying that, doing things the more, I guess, expensive way meant that we could shoot this thing from any angle we wanted. So mm -hmm. we knew that when we were going into it, we could give James Gunn the opportunity to position the camera anywhere in the, in the scene and it would just work. So after actually generating these pillars and everything, every pillar has been dressed with the tiniest of, I guess you would call it fungi, like uh, they kind <laughs> of resembled fungi. It was, okay. Just all this additional detail was dressed on top by our layout department and they just scattered all of this additional geometry detail on top of all the base that has all the holes and the fractal detail. You know, all those cool little bits of design, how much of that creativity is directed and given to you where it's like, I want this exactly, and how much of that is left up to you guys just come up with cool ideas? It's a a little bit of both, to be honest. We will oftentimes get some previs done by another vendor. For Marvel, they like to work with a company called Third Floor, and they produce so much work. Like, I think there's just so much going on right now that they're having to source from other companies. And we'll match the shots, but sometimes they'll say, you know, this shot could be a little bit better if it was done this way or that way, and we'll alter to suit. Yeah, especially something like this that has very unique and specific art direction. It's hard to know whether or not it's working until you're at a certain point in the process. Yeah, that's exactly right. When they're shooting things, they have no idea that, I mean, 
<laughs> that, that's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> big lightning face. Yeah, with a huge, I don't know, rolling ball of energy. It's all kind of on the fly, yes. I mean, not all, but you know, it, it very much uh, gets to that point at certain times. Okay, we got a little nerdy and detailed about that sequence there. So I think most of that's probably gonna end up on the website. So make sure you're subscribed to quarterdigital.com to see us go into some pretty granular detail about that whole sequence. There's a free trial, no skin off. The back. No skin attached. <laughs> no skin attached. Skinless. <laughs> it's always crazy to actually study the visual effects from the people who created them. So Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a huge honor to have you here. I wish you the best at the Oscars this weekend. By the time this episode comes out, all the news around the Oscars will be out, but you'll be there witnessing it in real time. Oh, wow. And I'm a little jealous. That was a... Uh... Greatest night in the history of television. So that's gonna be really awesome, but more than that, thank you for being here. Yeah. I really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been awesome. I do watch you guys a lot. So that's, it's it's pretty crazy, crazy to be sitting here on this green couch. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate the time. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you.